Good afternoon. Welcome to PCI's webinar series. This presentation is sponsored by Precast Prestressed Concrete Institute. My name is Royce Covington, and I'm the bookstore manager at PCI. I will be your moderator for this session. Before I turn the controls over to your presenters today, I have a few introductory items to note. Earlier today, we sent an email to all registered attendees with handouts. The handouts are also available now and can be found in the handouts section of your webinar pane. If you do not have the course handouts, please email PCI Marketing at marketing at PCI.org as shown on your screen and you will get one. In addition to copies of the handouts, your webinar pane has an area for you to raise your hand. If you raise your hand, you'll receive a private chat message from me. If you have a question, type it into the questions pane, and I'll be keeping track of your questions and will read them to the presenters during the Q&A period. If you have enabled audio controls, please make sure your phone is on mute. Disclaimer, this program content does not constitute approval by PCI nor does it necessarily reflect the views or positions of PCI or those of their respective officers, directors, members, or employees. Questions related to specific products or publications will be addressed at the end of the presentation. This presentation is non-CEU and not endorsed by AIA. Our presenters for the day are Andrew Bader, the Vice President and Co-Founder of Additive Engineering Solutions, LLC, in Akron, Ohio, and Mo Wright, the Marketing Director at Gate Precast Company. I will now turn the controls over to them. Okay. Thank you, Royce, for that introduction, and uh, can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so today, uh, I want to go over a session overview with everyone. So in the beginning, we'll be talking about 3D printing technology as a whole. For some of you, this might be the first time getting a real introduction to 3D printing. So we want to start with the baseline of what the technology out there exists and kind of how it all works. Then we'll talk about how we're using 3D printing specifically in the precast industry. We'll go over some case studies uh, like the Domino uh, Sugar Project uh, with Gate Precast and Mo Right on the line, as well as a um, Wells Precast project. Uh, We'll go over the values and the different benefits of using 3D printed forms over traditional methods, um, when it's uh, good to actually use them, when it makes sense, and what, what the future holds for 3D printed forms. So the learning objectives today are, are kind of twofold. I want people to, when they walk away from this uh, session, to have a better understanding of the basic workflow of the 3D printing process and also the design process, right? You know, you understand how we get it done in 3D printed, but how did it start? What files and digital models do you end up using? So you'll get a good understanding of that basic workflow. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the benefits of 3D printed forms over traditional methods and when it makes sense to use them. You know, a lot of people ask, um, you know, in what cases are, are the best situations to use them? When do they not make sense? So we'll go over all that today. So getting right into things, um, we're gonna talk about additive manufacturing and that's the same thing as 3D printing. They're, they're one and the same and can be used interchangeably. And basically all 3D printing is, is taking material that is layered on top of itself over and over again in a specific path to build a 3D object. Um, and there's all different types of 3D printing. Uh, that's what a lot of people don't know. There's actually um, almost, there's probably over 10 different technologies that exist within 3D printing. And what you see here on the screen is um, 
pretty typical of a desktop 3D printer. Some of you might even have these in some of your departments or have seen these at schools, uh, libraries have them now. So it's, uh, it's kind of the, uh, the standard uh, desktop 3D printing machine. There's other types where they're using robotic welders where they basically weld a bead of steel on top of each other to build a 3D object. They melt powdered metal with lasers. They do UV curing of liquid resins, all different kinds of technologies. But today we're going to focus on the plastic extrusion, um, kind of like you see here in this picture. So we're going to go over the 3D printing process, how we start with an idea and actually get a part. So I'm going to run everyone through just kind of a, a, a quick little scenario. You see this um, printed piece on the left-hand side, and this is a pencil or pen holder for your desk, something really simple. How this uh, happens is first we have to create a digital model. So there's um, many different types of 3D modeling software out there where you can sketch a design and create a 3D model uh, of a part that you want to print. So you start with this digital model. And once you have that done, you will import that file into your printer software. So uh, your, your printer is basically ran by uh, a special software that you would get. And if anyone is familiar with CNC machining, uh, the 3D printing software is kind of like the CAM program for CNC machining. It's called a slicer. So the slicer will examine that 3D model you import, and it will automatically create code or tool paths that tell the printer how to move and exactly what to do. So step three, once you have that imported into the slicing program, you'll choose a variety of different printing parameters. And, and this is where a lot of the knowledge in 3D printing comes into play. As you can see, there's a lot of different settings here and different tabs that you can use to control the actual printer um, and uh, a bunch of various different ways to print. The fourth step is, is fairly simple. Um, you, you're going you're gonna to turn on your printer. You're going to get it heated up. Uh, you're going to load your material of choice. There's a variety of different materials to use uh, in, in printers. Um, but you're going to get all that set up and ready to run your, your printed part. Uh, last step really is just to print the parts in the printer software. Once you have all your settings set and the printer is set up and materials ready to go, there is a print button and you hit that. And um, as you can see here, there's a part loaded on this 3D printer. And at the end of it, you get your, your pencil or pen holder that you're looking to do for your uh, desk. Now, um, we'll kind of go into how does this relate on the large scale side, which is what we're going to talk about today. This is, you know, desktop 3D printer. So we're going to talk more about this large format additive manufacturing. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly similar process, but there are some uh, unique um, settings involved to print at a large scale. So what is this large format additive manufacturing? It's kind of desktop 3D printing on steroids. So this picture here is of a BAM printer made by Cincinnati, and that stands for Big Area Additive Manufacturing Printer. So this is the picture at our facility. It's a 25,000 pound 3D printer. So much, much larger than, than a desktop printer. Uh, we can print upwards of 12 feet long, five and a half feet wide by six feet tall. And we can actually take multiple pieces and put them together to create an even larger mold. Um, we deposit material, uh, all plastic materials, up to 80 pounds per hour. So we're pushing a lot of plastic out, and therefore that's how we can print very fast. So beforehand, you saw the material on a desktop 3D printer. Uh, it's called filament, and it kind of looks like a, like a weed whacker spool. And instead of um, a filament, we actually use pellets. Uh, they're some of the same pellets that are used for in the injection molding process. Um, so we buy them in, you know, 
thousand pound boxes and that's how we feed our printer material. So here's a great comparison here. On the left hand side, uh, and these are the two same exact parts, just one printed on a desktop printer and one printed on a BAM. Uh, the one on the left took about an hour on the desktop printer. And you can see the size there with the quarter in the picture. And then on the right hand side, this only took two hours and it was uh, about 100 pounds. And there's one of our engineers there so you can get at scale. So that's how fast we're printing. Um, it's kind of an order of magnitude uh, larger and faster. And there's the part um, being printed on our actual printer. We have a lot more pictures to show uh, as we continue on. So with large scale additive, it's really all about the layers. And you know, as I, as I said before, 3D printing is putting a layer of material down and then on top of that and on top of that and so forth till you build up your part. So, the reason why we print so fast is really the size of our layers. So if you look on the left hand side, the top down view, we can print anywhere from 0.33 of an inch to a full inch wide of a plastic layer. And then on the right hand side, the layer thickness, as you're building up, that can be anywhere from 0.15 of an inch to 300 thousandths of an inch. So we're printing a very thick and very wide beads of plastic, and that's how you get that kind of corduroy effect that you see on the part there. So the parts come off the printer fairly rough. And here's a uh, kind of a close-up view of a cross-section of a printed part, and you can kind of see a, a pen tip there uh, to show size. So like I said, very large beads, we can print very fast, um, and it comes off the printer uh, fairly rough. So what's the actual process look like to get something printed on one of these large machines? Like I said, it's, it's fairly similar to the desktop, but there are some nuances. So again, we also start with creating a digital model. Um, for the Domino Sugar project that we did with Gate, um, you can see there's one of the molds right there on a the screen. So that's one of our engineers in our 3D modeling software preparing that file to print. Um, we did, we took this basically right out of Autodesk Revit and into Autodesk Inventor. And Inventor is a 3D modeling software that we use. And we'll get a little bit more into the actual workflow of how we go um, from Revit and into an Inventor. But we got to start with that digital model first. So we will import that model once that's finished into our printer software, the slicer. And we'll start uh, setting the different parameters, um, which is uh, step three here. And like I said, there's all different kinds of parameters, uh, different temperatures to set across the machine. So Again, that's kind of a little bit more where the magic happens on setting up the printer and all the settings. So, you know, it's a little bit more involved on the large scale side uh, when we actually set up the printer material. So, like I said, we use plastic pellets, as you see in the top right hand corner here, and we have to dry those in a large material hopper, as you see on the left, and then we have a vacuum system that uh, pulls the material out of the dryer up to the extruder on the printer. And then once we have the machine all loaded up uh, and ready to go with material, uh, we too have a, have a print button and it's a little bit more involved. We don't so much just hit print and walk away. As you can see the control panel here on the printer, itse on the printer itself, um, there's a lot of different controls that um, we can select during a part being printed. So if we need to slow something down or speed something up, we can make adjustments on the fly. And because the part comes off very rough, um, one of the, uh, the final steps in creating a form 
for precast is to machine that part. Now machine allows us to get the exact dimension that is required and it cleans up the edge of the uh, form to create a nice smooth edge. So you can kind of see in this picture on the right hand side, we just started to uh, machine one of these domino molds and you can tell that we're just machining just a little bit off. Uh, we're not hogging a lot of material out. We actually minimize um, material waste quite a lot by printing the part just a little bit oversized from the original digital model so then we can machine it back to the correct size and achieve a nice surface finish. So you can see here along the bottom that you know we started with Revit uh, and we took a, a, a drawing and put that into Autodesk Inventor and created this 3D model. And then we put it into the printer software and was able to print it. And then we use another product called Autodesk HSM and that is the uh, CNC software that allows us to cut everything to the right dimensions. So that's one of our large uh, five axis CNC's in our facility where we cut all the forms um, for all of our projects. So we're gonna get into a case study where we kind of go in depth on our involvement in the Domino Sugar Project along with GATE and PCI and Oak Ridge National Labs. And we have Mo Wright, uh, the marketing director from GATE. He's going to introduce uh, the project to everyone on the line, talk a little bit about that, and then he'll hand it back over to me to talk specifically about um, the 3D printing process for this project. And Mo, yeah. you are good to go. Thank you, Andrew, uh, and, and thank you for everybody's time today. We really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> this, the Domino Sugar Project was uh, something that we had been working on for some time. Um, as you know, a building of this size uh, takes a little bit of time to design. Um, so uh, we were brought on board as a design assist partner uh, right out of programming um, in schematic design. When they, when they realized uh, they had done their material selection. They knew that they wanted to use precast. Uh, they reached out and and um, and got some samples. Uh, and from there, once the conversations um, ensued, uh, the uh, the owner and the architect realized that they wanted to uh, to engage um, a uh, subcontractor in this case, Gate, um, to uh, help them refine the design. Um, the number of uh, window types, the number of families was eventually what they end up, ended up becoming. Um, and uh, all the while, we were uh, engaged in a research project at the Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, so um, that research project was a, was a, a much smaller uh, scale uh, operation. <laughs> Uh, it was a smaller cornice piece that was uh, to be used on a project also in New York, but um, with a, a little bit of a longer fuse to it. Um, the, once once it became um, clear that that uh, the stars were aligning and that the um, in order to be able to meet material deliveries and and, uh, and meet deadlines with uh, pouring schedules and erection schedules and, and be able to pour this project out of precast, it, it really, um, uh, 3D printing became the, the driving factor. Um, so there was a lot of risk associated with switching gears from such a smaller project to uh, one of, of this, <laughs> this magnitude and of this profile, of high of a profile. Um, but once uh, once we shifted gears um, and we made went into full production, instead of making smaller pieces, making large scale pieces like this, um, once the testing was done and, and uh, the proving was done, we went directly into production. And that's the main thing about the 3D printing and that workflow Andrew was talking about earlier. Um, the speed at which you can move from model to actual product um, and, and the speed at which you can continually get that product 
from 3D printing um, is what sustains pouring schedules for two separate plants running at maximum capacity. <laughs> so uh, carp there's not enough carpenters um, uh, company-wide for us to have been able to produce and keep up with the pouring schedule that we were that we were able to maintain once we switched to 3D printing forms. And the, the other thing is, uh, Andrew, do you have more slides? Yeah. All right. So this is this is the key. Um, so top left, you've got your design assist mode where we're working on modules. We we go moved to Revit and we created the families um, for which the solids were pulled from the voids. You can see them in the purple on the on the right there. Those voids are what was what were uh, used to uh, what Andrew was referring to overprinting, um, and then of course. Um, placed in the hardware uh, into the mold and then, then putting in the building, putting the, the product on the building. Um, next slide, Andrew. So uh, this, this using this framework um, and is kind of key, especially right now um, with, with uh, taking advantage of 3D printing. Um, on the top, you've got your, your traditional delivery method, which is your preliminary drawings and detailed drawings, and you go out and you bid, you bid the project. Um, back during preliminary drawings, you were doing budgeting, and uh, once you bid, you've established your cost. It may or may not meet up with the, budget, the budgets. There may be also other issues that, that come about during the bid process that uncovers other items that weren't covered um, during the budgeting. So you've got a potential redesign, but regardless, you're headed into shop drawings. Um, so other trades are going to start drawing and, and trying to do their submittals, uh, which is a review and a, then a potential redesign for the shop. So um, taking all of those, all that risk that, that is associated with designing for construction and putting it back um, in design assist, in the design assist realm, reduces all that risk. And um, eventually, during that process, the path on the bottom there, once you get into detailed drawings and you're doing your final budget, the owner can then start to um, remove that nasty contingency word and either take that savings directly, uh, attribute it to over budgeting, or uh, maybe if it's a hospital or, or some other uh, facility like that, buy another MRI machine to make more revenue. So, um, next slide, Andrew. And yeah, that was one more thing. The, the design assist did allow us to coordinate closely with the, with the owner, Two Trees, um, to be able to take advantage of uh, tree cast concrete's inherent uh, nature, which is the buzzword these days, prefabricated product. Um, we were able to take the window systems and uh, install those windows at our facilities, uh, inspect, caulk, and test on the ground, uh, much safer, much faster, much less expensive, um, and then ship to the job site and install um, on site. One more, Andrew. Yeah, and uh, that's that's you now, Andrew. Is there anything did I, is there anything else that I need to cover as far as the Domino project? Uh, I think that's good, Mo. What we're going to do is we will talk okay. about some values and benefits, and I'll probably have you chime in from a firsthand experience on um, the results of the 3D printed molds for the Domino project. So Sounds good. Great. Thank you, Mo. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Domino Sugar project from the perspective of AES and what we had to do uh, to get everything to work. So overall, there was about 40 printed molds. Um, AES did about half of them, and Oak Ridge National Labs did the other half. Uh, the typical size was about 10 feet long, 5 feet wide, 2 feet tall, and they range anywhere from four to 500 pounds uh, each. Now, the material of choice that we've been using um, and what Oak Ridge uh, learned early on doing some preliminary work uh, with GATE and PCI was an ABS plastic with 20% carbon fiber um, yielded a good uh, strength 
and a good surface finish to cast on. So uh, to give you a little bit of uh, numbers here, print time was around anywhere from eight to 10 hours, depending on the uh, form that we were printing. And then machining time took about an additional four hours. So, you know, in about one shift, we could print one of these forms. Uh, and then in about half a day, we could machine it and it would be complete. Here's some pictures of the forms uh, in the casting beds at, at Gates facility. And you can see on the left-hand side um, in the back, there is a wooden form. And the reason for that is uh, basically Gate had identified the, the forms that were going to be used the most, right, with a high volume. Um, there were some forms that were uh, casted on uh, 200 times. So there's some very high volume forms in there, and we'll kind of get into that when we talk about the benefits of um, using an ABS 3D printed form. Uh, on the right hand side, you can also see um, in, in the smaller picture that uh, after they had been machined, they were sanded uh, with about 180 grit. Um, they might have sanded them a little bit further than that, but they're, the plastic is easy to um, cut, it's easy to sand if you really want to. Uh, at AES, we've taken and we've, we've even buffed um, some molds up. Now, a lot of molds don't need that high of a uh, surface finish, but it's able to get that high. But for this project, I think we were somewhere between 180 grit, 220 grit um, for, a, for a form surface. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about repairing, right? You know, so what happens if you, you, you drop a hammer on it, you, you, you gouge it with a, a forklift or a screwdriver or something like that. Um, so we have a, a repair product that's it's really similar to Bondo. It's, it's a two-part product. Um, it's easy to sand. It's, it's also a black color, so it blends in very well. And we've also used this material um, combining pieces together and we've had good success with hiding seams. We actually did one of these molds where we had it split down the middle and we bonded it uh, with this two-part epoxy to see if they would get uh, visible seams after castings. And um, in our discussions with Gate, uh, those went well and uh, it did hide the seams. So good success there. But everyone always has a question on, you know, what do you, what do you do if uh, the inevitable happens and, and you got to make a repair? So uh, it's pretty straightforward. So we'll kind of talk about the value proposition and why you would use these versus a traditional form and so forth. So what we kind of did was we compared a 3D printed ABS form to a you know, wood fiberglass or a wood and resined uh, traditional form. So we'll go through a variety of different uh, value topics. So the first one we're gonna talk about is durability. Uh, the last time that we had some contact with Gate, and it was just a few weeks ago, um, like I said earlier, they had poured on a couple of our molds uh, 200 times. And they saw very little degradation in the form itself. Um, I were told I was told a you know very low maintenance. They did a little bondo here and there, um, not a big deal. But they have been holding up very well, um, even at the 200 uh, pour mark. Now with a wood fiberglass, you know you're going to cut your you're going to cut your plywood, you're going to assemble it all together, um, caulk your joints, uh, fiberglass over resin, all of that, and um, from my understanding, it can be, you know, upwards of around 20 pours before you might need to scrap that mold and make a new one, right? And, and in between each pour, you're doing, you know, a lot of reconditioning and, and fixing and repairing. Um, so they're kind of more high maintenance uh, than the 3D printed ABS. Andrew, I'm going to help you out on this one. Um, sure. The, the thing about... Um, the wood and fiberglass molds that's so critical um, when you're when you're working in this uh, realm is uh, we, it's critical for us to stay on a pour schedule. 
So once once we start pouring, um, having an unexpected down day uh, because you weren't able to complete your mold repair is a very expensive proposition. Um, so the ability to to be able to turn um, your mold daily and run your reconditioning back to maybe you know every 20 or 30 pours. Um, and then a, a very simple Bondo repair with a hair dryer and some chemicals and some sandpaper. Um, it, it dramatically changes your outlook if you are a scheduler. Perfect. Yeah, that's 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 very true. And I, I think I talked about that a little bit further on, but I, that's a that's a great point to bring up uh, of how the benefits of having a very durable mold and how that affects your schedule. That's great. Um, so I want to talk about the ease of use, and this, this kind of blends in a little bit, but the great thing about a 3D printed piece, and, and I'll give credit to Mo because he pointed this out to me, it's, it's one monolithic piece, right? There's, there's not a lot of different pieces of plywood being put together. There's no caulk joints. That, those forms were printed as one solid piece on the printer, um, and you know, using the CNC, we're able to create very crisp lines and edges. Uh, you know, after you sand the ABS material, it's very smooth. Uh, some of the results coming back from Gate was that it released, uh, the concrete released off of these ABS molds uh, easier, um, which is probably, you know, contributed to the fact that uh, they're more, it's more durable, it's smoother, uh, therefore uh, it'll release easier. You know, with, with the wooden fiberglass, you have you have multiple pieces that are nailed or screwed together, you're, you're caulking joints, it's difficult to achieve, you know, tight, crisp corners, um, especially when you're using fiberglass. So just kind of an, an overall ease of use, um, the ABS makes it easier. So speed, uh, you know, I kind of alluded to the fact that it took about, you know, a day to print one of these molds and then about another half day to machine it and sand it uh, to the point where it was good to deliver. Um, so from our end, manufacturing perspective, you know, it basically took two people over two days to complete one of those five by 10 foot molds. Uh, therefore, the, the turnover and deliver uh, for the molds was faster. Um, from the wood and fiberglass, you know, Mo pointed out that, you know, they didn't have enough carpenters throughout the business to cut and assemble and resin, um, you know, 40 of these molds, if not more than that, at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, it can take even a, a team of skilled uh, carpenters, um, you know, several days to complete one of these molds. So it's this idea that, you know, you're using labor to build molds versus labor to keep production moving and pouring. So the economics, you know, everybody wants to know about the economics. So for this project, those molds were between eight to nine thousand dollars per form. Um, and you know, you got to kind of look at the soft costs as well with that. So um, not a lot of loss of production time due due to um, you know the fact we didn't have to recondition the molds and, and lose multiple days over the course of months of of pouring. Um, what I gathered, the wood and fiberglass could be somewhere around three thousand dollars if it was outsourced, and then maybe maybe half that if it was done in house. Um, but you have to also take into consideration that there were uh, several of these molds that were poured on up to two hundred times. There was quite a few that were poured on, you know, seventy five, a hundred times. So you would have needed to uh, create multiple forms um, to get that number of pours. So. Um, when you're going up over 100 um, and get, definitely getting close to the 200, we were actually saving money at the end of the day from the cost of the mold and from uh, reducing lost production time. Was there anything there, Mo? Um, just to keep in mind that the, um, these molds were 20 inches deep um, and had a, had a very large surface area. Um, so not every mold is going to have that you're not going to need a form that uses that much material. Um, you know, if you're dealing with a cornice insert or 
some other piece that's a, that's a part of another mold. Um, uh, like a, I mean, a per perfect example is a, is a, a cornice insert um, that's a part of another larger wooden form. Um, be a, a much much less expensive than the eight or nine thousand dollars to form. Um, still taking advantage of the of the durability of because uh, you're pouring on that profile. And typically, you know, when you're doing complicated pieces like that, um, number one, it, you're detailing it in Revit uh, and your um, your printing and, and CNC machining operation is going to be faster. It's also going to be more accurate because it's going to directly uh, reflect the the designer's model um so that's another key factor um but uh when you were talking a minute ago about um how easy it releases um when you when you're doing cornice work um column capitals anything that's decorative like that uh when you pull the the piece of concrete out occasionally you get some sticking um that can do one of two things a um do some damage to your mold or, or b um uh chip a little off of the the precast concrete uh creating something that you're that nasty word patch um so uh that's one of the key key things when when because i came from project management um so uh any chance you you have the opportunity to reduce um you know opportunity or reduce chances for uh patching to be done that that's uh, the dollars that you're seeing on the screen here are, are minor uh, when you start talking about patching yeah and that's great and uh, yeah i will talk a little about kind of like hybrid molds where you know maybe not the entire mold needs to be printed um but you know just like most and maybe making a you know a long cornice piece or insert into you know a, a wooden mold because um, complexity is, is is a whole nother thing. Maybe you don't need 200 pores, but you have a, a complex piece. And since we're finishing all of our molds on a CNC, the CNC is is getting you know to 30 thousandths of an inch uh, quality. Whereas you know maybe it's not that typical to have that tight of tolerances, you know, on a wooden mold. You're probably looking more at a you know a sixteenth of an inch. Um, but we can hold very tight tolerances on our on our machined uh, form. So, um, yeah, very very good insight to think about um, how you can maybe use hybrid approach. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that right now, actually. So here's the here's the cornice piece that um, Oak Ridge did with Gate in the beginning um, to test out this process. So. You know, another great thing about 3D printing is really the design freedom. It's very simple on a 3D printer, or I should say it's more simple than a traditional material to create a lot of curves, you know, your swoops and sweeps and kind of these more organic designs. So, you know, this picture here in the middle and then this um, picture here on the right hand side, you know, there's a lot of twists to it, a lot of curves. Um, you know, those were just as simple as uh, for us to print as, you know, a square box would be in some cases. So we're able to open up, and this might be a little bit more for, you know, designers and architects, but, you know, you can see what the possibilities are. Um, and, you know, because before you're always tied to what can actually be manufactured at the end of the day. Well, this opens up um, the design freedom a little bit to, to come up with different kinds of designs that would be very difficult to produce through traditional tooling and molds. So this is another uh, value that 3D printing uh, can bring. Um, with that cornice piece, you can tell that was printed all in one piece and machined, and the results were uh, fantastic on that. So material selection. So, um, you know, not only are we introducing a new manufacturing method to create a form, we're really introducing an entire new material, which is the thermoplastic, the the, uh, the ABS plastic. So, you know, you have your, your wooden fiberglass, um, you might use some high density foam tooling boards, um, and then when you get up to more of the repetitive um, 
more uh, squared off, easier designs. Uh, you know, you get into your steel uh, fabrication as well. So, um, you know, I've got a couple quotes here from, from Gate and Wells, um, two, two folks that we've done projects with. And, uh, you know, the wood pieces have to be nailed and caulked and resined. Whereas, you know, the 3D printed molds are very smooth and there's no transitions uh, because it's all that monolithic piece. Um, we'll talk about a, uh, a project we did with, with Wells and, you know, they stated they couldn't have obtained the look they got um, and the better appearance, better appearance by doing it with any other material than the ABS. So here's kind of uh, what I want everyone to uh, take away from this session is when does it make sense to use 3D printing to make a form? So number one, if the form geometry is too difficult or uh, it's maybe too expensive to produce traditionally, if you have a lot of detailed cornice type pieces that have to be uh, manufactured, that might be a great opportunity um, for 3D printing. And you can tell, and I'll go back here, um, you know, we could just make that cornice piece and you could make it, you know, 10, 15 feet long, whatever it needs to be. And you could insert that into a traditional wood form um, just so you can get that complexity driven by the 3D printing. So number one, if the form geometry is too difficult or too expensive, it's, it's a good idea to look into what 3D printing can do. Two, we kind of uh, alluded to earlier was when larger volumes require, you know, when you're getting 50 plus cores and you might have to make a few wooden forms to uh, get that rate, um, it might make sense to go to 3D printing. And especially when you get over 100 and, and these larger volume projects, I think there's a great benefit to using the ABS plastic. Um, we talked a little bit about this earlier and about keeping your production uh, schedule and when your labor is also limited, right? Uh, would you rather use your, your labor in your shop to be producing forms or use them to be pouring uh, concrete? So 3D printing helps speed up the form building process. We're, we were able to keep gate on schedule by you know, consistently feeding them uh, forms throughout uh, the manufacturing process. And so they could just focus on what they do best, which is actually pouring the concrete. Um, and then fourth is kind of this, this time constraint, and that kind of that kind of flows into um, the step three there. But uh, the ability to quickly manufacture and deliver these forms to stay on schedule, and when the forms are more durable, there's less downtime for reconditioning. So if you have a if you're time constrained and you have a tight schedule, uh, this might be a, a great way to stay on schedule, uh, so you can meet your delivery date. Um, a couple more uh, quotes that, you know, I pulled out of a, a magazine article, actually, that just came out not too long ago. But from Gate, you know, the 3D printed molds can create these more complex, intricate pieces, which may not actually be possible to be produced any other way. Um, from Wells, they talked about eliminating that downtime, right, Com compared to losing three or four days overall when you're replacing and, and aligning new forms um, Whereas with the 3D printed, you can just keep going. And like I said, once they got up to 200, um, we know they can go more. They just didn't need to go more than 200 at that time. So, you know, we feel like the, the molds can last for a, at least a few hundred pieces. So what we did with Wells, you know, we did a smaller project where the forms weren't nearly as big as, as the gate molds, but you know, they needed uh, qu quite a lot of molds in a short amount of time. So it was similar to the Domino project where they were window opening style forms. Um, you know, they were only maybe uh, three or four inches tall, but they were, you know, several feet wide, several feet long. You kind of see in these pictures here. Um, but we, we created about 33 of these molds and delivered it in about five weeks. So we got them a lot very fast. Um, and uh, it helped them out because they had a tight schedule they needed to, uh, to to get at. And they said basically the same thing Gate did along uh, the quality of the molds. There was the very crisp lines on these corners that they said they would not be able to get traditionally out of you know wood and resin, fiberglass. Um, so that worked out very well for them. 
And Andrew, um, the yeah. uh, the key with that last photo uh, that you had up, um, yep. hearkening back to the design assist conversation we were having not too long ago, um, that um, the window opening that you see there is uh, what's your precision, your tolerances that you that you guys uh, see in C2? Yeah, on stuff like this, you know, we're probably within you know 30 or 40 thousandths, if not better of an inch right so 0 0.03 0 0.04 yeah. so the p the pci manufacturing tolerance is a quarter inch um so uh, and when you're piecing together your window opening and you're using parts and pieces um you know column cover spandrel to to, to make window openings if you're moving to a larger um system like this uh your your window opening is uh, what you just called out if you're using the 3D printed mold. So that, that allows you to, to work closer with the uh, glass supplier, uh, develop a system that you know is going to fit because uh, it's coming directly from the model. It just, it, it just goes a long, long way to reducing uh, potential risk in building construction. Uh, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic point. Um, you know, that assembly that you have to do afterwards um, makes everything that much easier. Absolutely. So kind of, you know, what I had talked about in the very beginning was the last point was going to be about some future work, right? What's going on for the future of 3D printed molds? So, um, you know, we're doing a little bit of work with high concrete and we looked at, you know, some of these hybrid tools that we can do, you know, the 3D printing, it, it, it's not, uh, it's not cheaper than wood, obviously. It's a lot more durable, but we figured, okay, can we do a hybrid approach, right? Can we make the, the face of the mold out of, you know, 3D printed material, and then can we use, you know, a wood substructure? In this case, it was LSL lumber. So we did a project with them that we wanted to make something, you know, kind of big. You know, what you see here on the right, it's about 20 feet long. Um, and the idea is, you know, if these were just completely flat panels, um, it would make more sense to use, um, you know, just just standard plywood and resin. Uh, but this uh, part on the right hand side would actually uh, there'd be two more molds after that to create a 60 foot long form. And there's a slight twist over that 60 feet. So there actually is um, some geometry other than just, you know, flat panels there. So this is something very interesting. You know, this is on a uh, a next level when it comes to size. Um, you know, some, we're printing some of the largest things that we've ever uh, printed before here at, a, at AES. So there's some exciting things going on with these large hybrid style molds. So there's, there's a lot of different ways um, that you can look at a project and see how you can save cost and time um, by taking some creative approaches. Um, also with high, uh, we tried a single 3D printed part um, and see how that would compare to that hybrid approach earlier. So this is actually, a, this is one of the larger things that we've printed. And you can see on the photo on the right, all these little shapes. And those are basically light weighting. So, you know, instead of printing a full backside of this mold, we actually um, modeled in to that digital model in the very beginning of the process, all these holes within the mold that it keeps it rigid, but you don't need to have all that material there. And it lightweights it a little bit more, and we don't use as much material so we can save on cost. So some exciting things there that uh, we're, we're doing um, with some other companies as well. So that's the uh, that's the end of our presentation. Um, I'll hand this over to Royce if you want to close it up, but I, we do have some time for questions. Thanks, Mo and Bob, for a great presentation. I would like to remind all our attendees that if you have any questions, to please type them into the questions section of the webinar pane. At this time, our presenters are going to answer the ones that we've gotten so far. Um, the first one would be 
uh, can the material that was machined off of a piece be recycled as material to print another piece? Sure, that's, that's a great question and we, we get that all the time. At this moment, there have been no, um, no solid solutions for recycling. Um, again, you know, they're more like shavings and because there are fibers uh, within the pellets originally, it's hard to know that if we go back to recycling, uh, what percentage of fibers might still be in there. So, you know, that could, that could change the properties of the material and maybe create not as strong of a material um, for recycling. But it's, it's something we are looking into and it's a lot different to recycle, um, you know, these shavings versus uh, some injection molded parts that people have done. So it's something we're looking into, but uh, have not come up with a solid solution yet. And that, that, that also is happening at Oak Ridge. Um, there, that's, uh, everybody's looking at it concurrently. Um, we definitely yes. want to keep in mind, um, uh, you know, limiting our, certainly uh, what's being delivered to landfill. So uh, all of these products in some form or fashion are being recycled, um, but not quite made it back to printing with that same material. Correct. Uh, next question. What type of mix, des mix design do you use for the concrete? You want me to take that one, Andrew? Yep. Uh, modified STC, um, which is uh, it, you're using the same recipes that you would for a traditional self consolidated concrete mixture. Um, but for, uh, for instance, the Domino project, um, that was a modified SEC. So this, the, the, the uh, spread was more between 14 and 16 inches rather than 22 or 28. Um, so, um, and then the other factor that I want to point out, um, those, uh, with it being 20 inches deep like that, we ended up getting, because of the surface, and I, it's hard to explain because you're also sanding resin, uh, but because the surface is so compact, uh, the pouring surface on these molds is so compact, um, you, uh, it's almost completely free of bug holes um, on its own um, without, without vibrating from the inside. We, we started attaching vibrators to the inside of the mold um, originally, which is also something you can't do on, on wood or fiberglass molds. Um, if you had, a, the, they can stand the extra abuse of the vibrators shaking the molds from inside out. Um, but we started reducing the number of vib vibrators attached and, and slowly but surely uh, weaned ourselves off of vibrating from inside completely. Um, so, yeah. Uh, next question, uh, it's a two part. What do you use as mold break to prevent the pour from sticking to the mold? And do you lift the molds through the light weighting holes? Could you say that? No, one more I'll time? Take, I'll, I'll... Okay, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the second part of the question. So, um, lifting. Yes, in, in that last. Um, uh, in that last picture, we saw those light weighting holes. We do take straps and we just put straps through there. And you know, you can either lift it with an overhead crane, or you know, we have a jib boom on our tow motor that we can lift it with. Um, we have been able to drill holes through the side of the mold, um, you know, not through a critical surface, um, and then put in, you know, an eye bolt and then a nut on the other side. And, there, and therefore, you have a, an anchor point that you can lift. Um, so it's pretty easy to drill through the ABS plastic. So if you wanted to put your own inserts in there or just drill a hole to put a strap through, it's, it's uh, pretty simple. Now, Mo, the, the first question was about uh, what mold release are you guys using? Uh, just traditional form release, form oil. Um, and, and it works just fine. And, and Andrew is correct. All, all we did was um, loop the straps um, through the holes that were the internal uh, braces uh, for the domino mold, flip them up, um, over the 
crane hook and pull them out. That's it. Next question. How long do you think it will be until we have 3D concrete printers to make the actual panel and bypass the form altogether? <laughs> that's a, Andrew, that's a great I've question. Had, I've, I've had lots of <laughs> conversations with Oak Ridge National Lab about this, and I've, I see all kind of video all over the internet. Um, I've seen the latest in China. There was a bridge that was put together over a over a, a river in, in China, something um, not Oak Ridge has not been able to to reproduce that in as as a viable building material in the United States yet. Um, uh, Andrew, if you know more, uh, let me know. Yeah, and that, no, I, I don't know much more than that. You know, I, I think a lot of us have seen the. Um, uh, kind of the articulating arm that kind of goes around in a circle and, and you know builds a house right that that we probably all have seen online you know I think the issue would be how would you how would you constrain the concrete to a specific shape right you can extrude it out absolutely and create a tool path where you kind of create some large objects but you're going to get something very similar to what we get is that corduroy effect and it's not you know the stability of the dimension, you know, you might, you, you might be a half inch over or whatnot. So, you know, it might, it might work well for some things, but I think it's still pretty far out where it would be commercially viable. Um, but definitely something to keep, you know, your eye on. I think we still have time for a couple more questions. Uh, this next one is, did you notice any flexure or warping in forms with high pore counts? Um, well, we we did a lot of testing in the build up to pouring on these molds, um, and that was that was a part of getting the recipe right. Um, that's uh, coming in and narrowing in on the carbon fiber content played a role. Andrew, this is your specialty. I'll let you take over. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, basically that that all gets figured into the design, right? I think in the beginning when Oak Ridge was first designing the molds with gate, they might have even over design the mold and then they realize you know we can we can lightweight this a bit you know maybe we we put too much uh too many ribs in the middle of the mold and uh it's kind of like finding that sweet spot like okay how many ribs do we need to keep this very rigid um and from deflecting um so that's, that's part of the design up front um and you can model in all different kinds of you know infill patterns and, and ribbing to create you know a more rigid structure so but it's kind of that sweet spot where you know you don't want to over engineer it so you're printing an extra 100 pounds worth of plastic um that's a great question it's all done up front in the design phase uh the last question we have time for is going to be um how do you join the subparts of large forms together sure that's a great question so we have a variety of methods. Usually if we have two pieces that are gonna be mated together, we will also print a wider flange at those mating uh, joints. And what we can do is we can um, drill holes and then put uh, kind of like a steel rod in there and those work well to align it all up. So we get a really nice alignment when you're seeing, seeing the, uh, the holes in there and then putting those steel dowels in. Um, you can get a really nice alignment. Um, we'll take, you know, the adhesive, the two-part epoxy that we've used, and we can put that on the mating surfaces, align it with the steel dowels, and then we basically, you know, can use some large steel bar clamps and clamp it all together. Um, we can also drill holes um, all the way through, through holes, and put, uh, you know, bolts and nuts and, and tie it all down. So we've used a variety of you know, mechanical bonding with the adhesives, nuts and bolts, um, but it, it, it's kind of, you know, typical joinery methods. Well, thank you, Andrew and Mo, for a great presentation. And thank you to all our attendees for questions. Those that weren't answered, we'll make sure that we give our presenters a copy of questions. Uh, we'd also like to remind everyone that if you're gonna be at the convention in Louisville, this uh, topic will be covered Friday, uh, March 1st 
at 8.10 in the morning. So we'd like to see everyone there. And this concludes our session. Thank you again, and have a great afternoon.